Happy Monday, this is Martha with Nature Niche. And this week I wanna follow up on uh, my post last week where I talked about horse mint, Monarda punctata. Um, and today we're gonna talk about the better known, I think, uh, bee balm or wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa. So um, it is one of our four native Monarda species in Michigan. They're in bloom right now in July and just so much fun. Um, to watch and pollinator hunt around. So it is a great plant to have if you wanna attract pollinators, including our ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, and this species is in the, the mint family. This one um, you can find in dry to moist places, um, not as extreme dry as the horse mint I talked about uh, last week. Uh, bee balm or wild bergamot um, is most often found uh, in the wild in oak and jack pine savannas, prairies, fields, um, roadside areas. Occasionally you'll find it in um, sedge meadows and other moist places uh, along the edges of forests and thickets um, and along more open stream, stream banks um, and lake shores. Uh, also on stabilized dunes, and it does readily spread into disturbed places like rights of way and gravel pits and things like that, um, old fields, old pastures, things like that. Uh, it is known from across the state of Michigan, both across the lower and upper peninsula, and it occurs across the United States with the exception of um, California, Florida, and Alaska and it's across much of Canada as well. As far as horticulture goes, um, this is a very popular and showy uh, native perennial plant. You wanna put it in full sun to maybe just a little bit of shade. I found that it tends to flower less and get more leggy and a little floppy um, the shadier you try to grow this plant. It'll take dry to moist soils across a range of pH and across different soil textures, sand to clay. Um, so it makes it a very adaptable uh, garden plant for your landscape. Um, it doesn't tolerate flooding uh, for long periods, but it can take some standing water um, over the winter. And this makes it a really great uh, rain garden species. Um, and a hardy garden plant uh, in your, your pollinator gardens. Um, all the species of Modarda do get or are susceptible to um, powdery mildew, uh, and this species is prone to it. You can see the, the gray splotching here um, on the leaves. To help prevent that, uh, you can make sure the plant has good drainage and good um, air circulation and try to water the base of the plant rather than splashing a lot of water um, up onto the leaves. But if you step back, I really don't think it's noticeable and it's not uh, detrimental to the, the health of the species. Um, bee balm um, or wild bergamot is fairly drought tolerant. Sometimes the lower leaves will yellow and drop off. That's a normal response to drought stress. Um, and when it's happy, it, it will spread um, both by seed, and it's really easy to start by seed. So um, you can, uh, you don't have to cold stratify it, and it is one of those species, if I'm doing a wildflower seed mix, it's one of the first things I see germinating um, out of that seed mix. And it also spreads by um, shallow rhizomes, and those are pretty short. Um, and so new stems come up near the parent plant, and that, that's what gives uh, this species its kind of brushy um, appearance. Uh, it does have many branched, fairly deep uh, roots, which makes it great for erosion control and trying to rebuild um, healthy soil structure on your property. Uh, some of the more intense um, traditional gardeners will say you want to lift and divide the plant every three years. If you're trying to contain it or keep it in a certain space, you can also collect the seed about two months after it blooms um, and readily start it uh, by seed to have it elsewhere on your property. 
As far as identification goes, this native perennial forb gets two to four feet tall and uh, typical of things in the mint family. And just like horse mint we talked about last week, it has a square stem. This one uh, lacks hairs. It also has opposite leaves. So typical things, um, characteristics of things in the mint family. And the leaves are um, broadly lanceolate to ovate and have a, a finely serrate or toothed margin. So you can see that there. Uh, they can be light to dark green, uh, depending on the environmental conditions around your plant. I think from a distance, they're sort of a gray green color compared to other species and surrounding vegetation. Um, and the stems tend to, to branch more um, in the upper half of the plant. And um, when cr um, crushed, the leaves give off a minty um, oregano scent. So that's fun. N another nice scratch and sniff plant to add to your landscape. Uh, flowers occur on the major stems in rounded heads and I've heard people describe them as sort of a ragged looking pom-pom. I, I think of them as the fireworks flowers. It looks like an exploding fireworks to me um, and those can be one to three inches across and they consist of these tubular flowers. So each one of these is an individual flower. It's one inch long, um, beautiful lavender pink color. And this species blooms from the, the center of the flower head out. So you end up, as it matures, you end up with a wreath of the freshest flowers um, on the outside. Each flower um, has an upper lip that's tubular with projecting um, stamens. And then the lower lip is composed of uh, like three three parts that um, serve as a nice landing pad for insect pollinators. And this species blooms midsummer uh, here in Michigan. That's July um, and August. Uh, that'll definitely be earlier the further south you are. And the uh, bloom time is approximately one month. Uh, as far as faunal associates go, you can see lots of things flying around this uh, bee balm in my own backyard. And this species really is a staple garden plant for anyone who wants to attract ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, it's great. It blooms during their prime nesting season, provides great nectar support for them. The nectar also attracts long-tongued bees, including bumblebees, minor bees, Epiline um, cuckoo bees and large leaf cutter bees, as well as butterflies, skippers, hummingbird moths, and bee flies. They also love the nectar. So this is a great plant to help attract eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly, great spangled fritillary, common wood nymph, um, monarchs, and it's also a known nectar plant uh, for the federally endangered and state threatened Carner blue butterfly. There is a uh, smaller black bee that um, specializes, in, as, specializes in actually going into the tubular flowers um, and pollinating them. And uh, helictid bees are also known to collect the pollen. And there are some wasps that will uh, approach the flower from the side and poke a hole in and steal nectar from the side rather than having to reach in from the front of the flower. Uh, this species is also a host plant for some moths, including the hermit sphinx and the gray marvel. And in general, it tends to be avoided uh, by mammalian herbivores like deer and rabbits. I have to admit, I've had some of mine chomp um, early in the growing season when the young shoots are coming up. Um, but in general, they leave it alone. Uh, it looks like there might be some research out there about uh, the plant containing chemicals that disrupt uh, beneficial gut bacteria and lead to um, some indigestion. So 
uh, a relatively uh, deer and rabbit resistant native plant. As far as uses go, the flowers are edible and the leaves can be chewed uh, fresh or dried. They can be boiled to make a minty tea used for seasoning and um, the oil can even be used as a perfume. Historical uses are many, um, everything from respiratory ailments, stomach aches, nosebleeds, heart trouble, um, sore throat, lots of, lots of other things that this has historically been used for in the past. Uh, but I just think it makes a great pollinator, prairie, um, rain garden, or bioswale plant for lots of different landscapes. So. I hope you're able to get out, uh, find this plant uh, in your landscapes, um, or think about placing them in your landscapes, and enjoy all the pollinator activity. Take care. Have a good week.